Amen. Praise the Lord. We've got a treat today. Our pastor's out of town. That's We don't rejoice in that, but we're... <laughs> Yes, it's really great. Pastor's gone. Uh, actually, we've got a treat because we have a guest speaker with us, Pastor Rich Venegas. Amen? Uh, let me just tell you a little bit about Rich. He's an associate pastor at our Brook Glen, Washington, D.C. campus, which is right up the way from here, where he's been a member for more than 20 years. As a 19-year-old college student at Bridgewater College, uh, he met the Lord Jesus Christ, gave his life to him, and then... Uh, surrendered his life uh, to a call to ministry. For most of that ministry, he's focused on the college campuses, which was one of the primary reasons we came here in 1982 was to reach out to the college campuses. And I've got a history with every one of these campuses. We've had outreaches at all of them way back in the day. He has served as campus missionary, director, pastor, has helped establish ministries at American, Georgetown, and George Washington universities. He has served as chaplain of the Howard University and Bowie State football teams and as character coach for the University of Maryland football team. In addition, he's uh, currently pursuing a master's degree of theology and mission with Every Nation Seminary. What do you do in your spare time, Rich? <laughs> uh, perhaps most importantly, he is uh, married to Jamila and uh, they've been married for 15 years. They have two children. Hope and Jackson. And so would you welcome uh, Rich to share the word of God with us this morning. All right, all right. How y'all doing this morning? All right, it's a little bright up here. So good to see your faces. Uh, as they said, I'm one of the pastors at our Brooklyn location. So every now and then I'll kind of slide in the back doors of this church when something was going on here. And I would sit somewhere over here for a little bit and then have to slide back over to Brooklyn. But it's good to, to see you all from, from this perspective. So thank you all for being here. It's an honor to share God's word uh, with my family. Yes. Right? It would be weird to say, we bring greetings from Brooklyn. But right. no, no, you are we yes. and we are me. Yes. And it's yes. good looking at me. Yeah. <laughs> and I hope you're looking at you as well. Uh, and I just want to say, Matt, we love, we love your team here, the, the worship team, the AV, everyone's serving, but in particular, Pastor Stephen and Pastor Elise. I, I knew, uh, I met Pastor Stephen when he was still in high school. And so if you're wondering what Pastor Stephen was like in high school, he was exactly the same. <laughs> he was always so mature, except he looks exactly the same as well. So if you were to shave his beard off and cut his hair, he will still look like that 15, 16-year-old boy that I met way, way back when. But no, but we love him. My family loves him. Uh, I want to show you all a quick picture of my family. Uh, if you look at the screen here, you'll see a picture, uh, if we have one. We don't have one? Okay, no worries. Well, I have a beautiful wife. So whatever beauty is for you, just imagine that. Uh, you know, she, she's not able to be here with us this morning, but her name is Jamila. Uh, we have two kids, Hope and Jackson. Hope is almost eight, and Jackson is four, and their smiles will change your life. So if you want to see a picture, come find me after service, and I'll change your life with that picture. Amen? All right. Well, let's jump into this word here. You guys ready? Yes, sir. So if you have your Bibles, please turn to Psalm chapter 127. If you don't have your Bibles, I believe the scriptures may or may not be on the screen. Either way, I will read it to you, okay? I'm just going to read verses 1 and 2. And it says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it, Labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives to his beloved sleep. Father, help us this morning. Help us receive what you are giving. In Jesus' name, amen. So I know we just met, some of us here, but I have a confession for you. That I'm going through a breakup with carbs. 
It's a, it's a whole will they, won't they kind of situation. We're on and off again all the time. Anybody in here trying to eat healthy? I know I, know I look like I have 0% body fat, but I have to be conscious about all the carbs. I have a very unhealthy relationship with it. But can I tell you that there is a much more toxic carb that I am trying to cut away in my life. And it comes from the bread of anxious toil. I am I'm ongoing working on this, even today, even last month, even next month. I will always be looking to cut these anxious carbs. In fact, that's the title of today's message, is Cutting Anxious Carbs. Several months ago, earlier this year, I had the great idea, because I'm a graduate of YouTube University, <laughs> I decided that I was going to change the brakes and rotors on my car, right. on my own. I, I pride myself, sometimes to a fault. I, I, I love following directions. I'm very detail-oriented. I like to thoroughly study and investigate and fully understand before I take on any endeavor, no matter how big it is. And I'm fully confident that I'm going to accomplish the task at hand. Any achievers in the room? <laughs> And that's me all day. So I take on this task. I've never done this before, but because I'm watching someone do it on a, in a video, I can do it too. And so I proceeded to, to, to get all the things necessary and follow all the steps. And I work on it. And I replace the, the brakes and I replace the rotors. And I'm all done. I'm all cleaned up. And I get in the car and I disengage the emergency brake. And I put it in drive. And the car didn't move. It's like, okay, maybe the emergency brake isn't all the way loose. So I jiggled it, like making sure, put it back in drive, and the car wouldn't budge. And I began to touch on the gas a little bit. I'm like, oh, maybe the brakes are just, maybe I put them on too tight. I don't know, maybe I missed something. And I felt the car wanting to move, but it was just stuck. And I was like, man, I really fixed these brakes really good. Because <laughs> the car won't move. And that, that feeling of joy and satisfaction of completing the task quickly made a 180. And the anxiety in my soul, the frustration, the, the, all the feels came rising up to the surface. Anybody ever been there with anything in your life? How quickly things can turn. And I sat there in my car just defeated, frustrated confused even. See, my anxiety was already present, though. I just didn't know it. I was already stressed out because I told my wife it would only take an hour. <laughs> and it had already been like two and a half. One of the main reasons why I did it was to save a few hundred dollars. So the thought of having to spend a couple thousand dollars to tow this car in and get something repaired, I'm like, oh my gosh. It's going to cost way more. And then the third reason, which I'm more, more, probably more embarrassed to say, so just leave this here in this room, okay? <laughs> is that I kind of wanted to validate my own manhood. Yeah, right. It's like sometimes I just want to do something that makes me feel like a man. There you go. It's like I just want to get dirty. I want to fix something. I, truthfully, I want to look into the eyes of another man and say, you never changed your brakes and rotors before? <laughs> As if I do it all the time? <laughs> but in that moment, just feeling the frustration, the pressures of time, money, and identity were overwhelming. Even as we were just singing that song, I'm like, God, I will not be overwhelmed. We need to sing it because we often feel that. We're not singing it because we're not overwhelmed. We worship and sing because we are. The truth is I'm, I'm often anxious. And we'll come back to that car story later. But I'm often anxious. But it doesn't always look like textbook anxiety, which actually makes it harder for me to actually identify. So I have a lot of unresolved anxiety in my life. But I want to look at, at this scripture here that we read this morning because in, in our life here, I genuinely believe that it's a lot less about trying to avoid anxiety altogether. It's more about trying to identify and then address the anxiety that we do have. And I believe this text that we read does just that. It speaks to that. Anybody in here want to cut anxious carbs? Yeah. All right, there's two steps. Here we go. The first step to cutting anxious carbs, identify the ingredient of anxious bread. 
Like I was saying earlier, when I, whenever I try to, when I was trying to get healthy and, and try to eat better, and I go grocery shopping, I start to do the one of the most depressing things that anyone who's trying to eat healthy could ever do, is start to read the nutritional information on the things that you normally <laughs> used to buy to make your food, and you start to quickly realize that carbs and sugar are in everything. I'm like, I remember the time in which I thought Gatorade was healthy. <laughs> I would work out and then drink 6,000 grams of sugar. It's Gatorade. Don't even get me started on ketchup. It broke my heart. <laughs> but those carbs and those sugars, they're, they're, they're obviously in things like candy and sweets. We know that. But when you find it in places that are hidden, in, in places that you thought were actually good for you, right. it can be devastating. And anxious carbs are just like that. You can find anxious carbs anywhere. They're hidden all over, not just in the bad things, but sometimes even in the good. Like work. Anxious carbs are not found in all work. What the scripture tells us is found in anxious work. It doesn't say don't build. It doesn't say uh, watch over the city. It doesn't say stay up late or, or wake up early. Sometimes in life, it's really, really good for you and for people for you to do those things. It's okay to go to sleep late. It's okay to wake up early. It's okay to work really, really hard, and I hope you all do. But I don't believe this, this, this scripture is speaking to our actions. It's speaking to the motivations behind the action. Why do you do what you do? Which means what? You can make anxious bread even when doing something good. It's possible to be, you can serve in this church, you can, you can do stuff with this church and do good things, but if you're serving from a place of anxious toil, it can become something that you need to cut. Not the thing you're doing, but how the motivation behind what you're doing needs to change. What is driving you? Because if your motivation is, it's all me, or it's on me. Tell me if you've heard this before. You get in what you put in. See, sometimes when we, we set these things up in our lives where it's all about us and what we do and what we need to get and how we can attain what we need. And when the focus is on us, that is a perfect recipe for anxious bread because we're building with ourselves. We're building for ourselves. And it's all dependent on me. And if I don't show up and do that thing, it will all fall apart. Well, let me help you. If something falls apart because you weren't there to actually do that thing, it's possible that you weren't building with the Lord. Because when you're building with the Lord and you can't show up that particular day, God's not going to stop building and he's not going to fall apart without you there. How are you building? But when your actions are rooted in trust in self versus trust in God, you'll eat anxious bread every day. When we talk about our emotional, spiritual, our mental, our physical health, whether it's exercising, eating healthy, sleeping, uh, medication, therapy, all the ways of dealing with the anxieties and the worries and the issues and the, and the troubles that we have in this world, when you, when they can become anxious toil if you're doing all those things without trusting God. You can do all the good stuff, but without trusting God, it's anxious toil. There's a pastor, one of our Avery Nation pastors in Vancouver. He's also one of the seminary professors, and he, he describes it like this. His name is Dr. Greg Mitchell. And he says, anxiety is a proper response to mistrusting God. So if you mistrust God, the appropriate thing to feel in that moment is actually anxiety. It's like saying if uh, you getting wet is a proper response to jumping in the water. That's what's supposed to happen when you do that. And that's what anxiety is. But don't miss this. This is critical. What's worse than being anxious? Not knowing why you're anxious. Anyone ever been anxious and you just can't pinpoint exactly why? That is so frustrating. I just wish I knew why I was anxious. I wish I knew what I was afraid of. But sometimes you just, I just feel but being able to pull on this thread of anxiety to find a place in which where at in my soul, where at in my thinking, am I actually mistrusting God in this moment that is triggering an anxious response? See, this can be a gift 
that just feeling anxious. Well, okay, stop being anxious. Stop being anxious. Stop being anxious. Oh, no, now I'm anxious for trying to stop being anxious. And the more you think about the anxiety, the greater the anxiety gets, as opposed to pulling on that thread to see where at. Is there, even just asking the question, where is there a place in my soul that I'm not trusting God? And can I help you? You may not get the answer after two or three questions. Keep sitting. Keep thinking. Keep asking God to show you where is the root of this particular feeling that in my soul. So that once you know what it is, which, by the way, that is the hardest step, is identifying the ingredients of anxious bread. But when you're able to identify it and if God reveals it to you, that's good news. Because then you get to go to step two. The second step in cutting anxious carbs, change the recipe. You change it. So when you identify the main ingredient, now you know what to change and what to cut. So what changes? The direction of our trust. We shift the focus of our trust from self and what we're capable of doing to God and what he's able to do. Charday preached this a few minutes ago, didn't she? When she was saying that, I was like, well, that's my message. I, I'm good. Love y'all. I was watching me preach, right? It's family. So she did a great job. But what are we trusting God for? And I believe in verse 2 that we read earlier, the writer here. He gives us two things. He's juxtaposing anxious toil with two promises, identity and security. Great. He's given us these two promises. The end of verse 2, he says this. And it's in a few words, but don't miss it. He goes, for he gives. So God is giving. We're not earning. We're not achieving. We're not justifying the gift. He gives. To his beloved sleep. So the first one is identity. God gives you a great name. He gives you an identity. And what is that identity? His beloved. You cannot earn or achieve being called his beloved. So he gives you identity. And you don't need to worry about your legacy. How much anxiety comes in our lives because we're worried about how we'll impact the world? Or how, how, how will I be seen? Or how will I be remembered? But you, when you are his beloved, you don't have to worry about your legacy. Because your legacy is his legacy. And you are now part of his legacy. And you don't have to worry about that being great. Anybody excited about that? Yeah. Anybody, anybody ready to stop striving for your own personal legacy, for your, your empire that you're building up right now? It's okay to let it go. The second promise is security. God gives you sleep. Some of you might be sleeping right now. Okay. I can't see most of you. <laughs> but God wants to give you sleep, and not just physical sleep, although, hallelujah, that is included, right? Praise God. But overall rest that's really rooted in security. You ever look at a baby sleep and we get that phrase, sleep like a baby? Right. When you look at a baby and they're sleeping in a way that you like, I wish I could just sleep like that for one night. And no matter how many pillows I have in my Amazon cart, it's not going to change. Because the way in which that baby is sleeping is not just physical, they just don't care. <laughs> they are secure because they're just, just, I love watching my kids sleep because it gives me rest. Because I know that they are resting in security. Because they don't have, they're not worried about where food is going to come from. They're not worried about where their clothes are going to come from. They're not worried about the stock market. They're not worried about the election. They're not worried about the gas bill. They're not worried about the weather and how hot it is outside. They're not worried about if they got to change their diaper or not. They just go whenever they want. <laughs> Every one of their needs are taken care for. So they experience a level of security that I believe we're all designed to experience. Except somewhere along the way, we lose that security. We can't sleep or rest anymore. Even when we sleep 12 hours, we still wake up like, I'm stressed and I need to sleep. You go on vacation, you come back, and you need a vacation. Man. But God is telling you, I believe through the scripture, that when you're his beloved, you can rest because you can trust in him. And you can experience 
See, we actually see this at work in Psalm 127. Um, when we see Psalm 127 in action in Genesis chapter 11. And I'm not going to go and read the whole chapter, but I would encourage you to go read it. But it's the story of the Tower of Babel. And it's in Genesis chapter 11. Here, if you, were, if you were to go there, I'll read one verse for you in a second. But here we see a whole nation of people. We see a group of people who are working really hard and really well, mind you. Good workers. Great engineers. Able to do fantastic, amazing things that the world had never seen before. Done by people. And they trusted in their abilities. And they trusted in their latest, greatest technology which was the brick. Pretty cool, huh? Aren't bricks cool? But to them it was. To them they're like, wow, we now can make the brick, which means we can now build structures that we have never built before. Stronger, bigger, better. Look at what we are capable of doing. And in verse 4 of Genesis 11, they said this. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. This is a rich text here that we are going to scratch the surface. They were feasting on the bread of anxious toil. You see it. They said it right here. They built this tower that they were hoping would reach to the heavens to get on the same level of God. They built it for two reasons that were rooted in anxiety. Anyone want to guess what they were? Identity and security. See, they were trying to empower themselves to make a great name for themselves. And the whole thought of not being scattered around the whole earth was them saying, look, there's power and unity in numbers, so we need to stay together or else someone's going to come and take what we got. And divided will fall, united will stand. See, they weren't stupid. They had wisdom. They were smart enough to do a lot of great things. But their motivation to do those great things were trust in self, not in God. So they're anxious about identity and anxious about security. And they decided to empower themselves, and it didn't do, go well for them at all. And if you go back and read it, they built it. But what they feared most came to pass as a result of what they did for what they feared. Isn't it interesting how that works? Their labor was in vain. Their anxious toil, which was meant to resolve their fear, was the very thing that actually prompted God to come down and eventually scatter them. In fact, the writer, when you read in Genesis, they, they, they write it in a way that we know God sees all, knows all, but they write it in a way that God says that he looked down and so he's like, what are they doing down there? Let us go down there to see what they're doing. The very thing that they thought that they were doing was great big and we're going to go to the heavens and we're going to go to God. God is like, even the biggest thing that you think you can do pales in comparison to just where I already am. That'll pop your little bubble about how great we are. And their anxious toil was present in motivating what they did. But what if? I don't know about you, but every time I read, I read stories in the Bible, it's like, oh, yeah, the Tower of Babel, those guys, man, they're whack. They made a huge mistake. Boo on them. Okay, great, move on. But I like to ask myself, what if I was them? Or more importantly, what if? Like, God, what would have happened if? It's like, you know when you watch the same movie over and over again, and sometimes you watch it hoping that they'll do something different? Like, don't open that door. Don't do it. Oh, they opened the door again. But what if they trusted in God for identity and security? What if they actually put their trust in God? Well, the Bible actually shows us what that looks like. See, Genesis 11 starts with a people trying to build something great for God or for themselves in vain. But Genesis chapter 11 ends with God starting to build something great. And his building material, not bricks. People. You see, at the end of chapter 11, we're introduced to uh, 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 one of the main characters that we'll see throughout the rest of Scripture. And it's the chosen people. God's special chosen people. And it starts with Abram. 
who eventually turns in, who eventually is named Abraham. And God chooses Abraham. So in the very same moment that that all the people here at this Tower of Babel are being scattered, as they're being scattered around the whole earth, God is like, no, 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 wait, 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 you, stop. Abram, come here. For no apparent reason other than God just chose them. There wasn't anything that Scripture tells us that was particularly special about Abraham in that moment. If anything, we could actually look back and realize there was something unspecial about him. And it was that him and his wife were unable to bear children. So he's like, Abraham, come here. I got you. Well, I'm, I'm flawed. Yeah, yeah, I know you're flawed, but come on. Yeah, 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 I know you can't have kids. That's kind of the point. I can do things that you can't. You can try to have kids all you want, but you will, pun intended, labor in vain. But I can do that for you. Unless the Lord builds the house, you labor in vain. And God eventually promises and gives to Abraham identity and security. Something that the entire nation of Babylon could not produce in and of themselves. I want you to hear this. Your hardest work will never come close to producing what God wants to just give you. Don't miss that. So going back to my car, ah, the memories. As I sat there defeated, I began to do just this, trying to identify and cut these anxious carbs. And I began to pull on that thread of anxiety it's kind of like an ugly sweater that we need to take off. And I begin to just keep pulling and pulling and pulling. And while I was pulling on that thread, I began to shift my thinking about the worst case scenarios to what God could do in each worst case scenario. I wasn't ignoring my present situation, the present problems, or what could happen, or what was going to be. I, I hit it head on. I said, well, what can God do? about those things. Because I know there's things I can't do that he can. And I began to find those roots of my anxiety in that moment. And it was really just a few questions. And one was, can God redeem my time with my family today? I was anxious about that. Mm. See, my feelings were anxiety. But I had to get deeper than just my feelings, which are important. And they're indicators and they help us. But I had to get to the point where, well, what is my thinking? Do I trust that God can redeem my time with my family? I do. Okay. I do trust God with that. Okay, that's, thank you. Well, what about the money? What if this costs $2,000 to repair and fix? Can God provide for you? Yes. I do believe that he can. I believe that. Well, what about your manhood? <laughs> Won't I be embarrassed? Am I still his beloved? You know what? No matter what I do today or what I didn't do, success or failures, I'm loved by God and that's enough for me. I believe that. I think that. So the thought of being embarrassed to tell, is it embarrassing? Yeah. So what? And then I had the thought, can I use this as an illustration in a sermon? <laughs> sure. See, the change didn't come as a result of me ignoring my present and potential realities. It was realizing God was able to take care of any reality. Yes. Amen. And that was what empowered, uh, it gave me the ability to change from trusting self to trusting God. Because he simply does things that we can't. Amen. That's the point. Some of you right now, you just need to hear God say, it's going to be okay. Whatever the situation is, not ignore it. I'm not sick. I don't have problems. My family's great. They're not dysfunctional at all. I don't have these financial concerns. I'm good. Praise God. Hallelujah. But some of you all just need to admit, like, I'm in a tough spot that I can't control and I can't get out of it on my own. But in that place, you need to hear God say, I got you. Trust me. I got you. Where have you been feasting on the bread of anxious toil? But the good news is, there's someone available to help you. I'll close with this. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus, these are Jesus' words. 
And I want you to hear these words with the backdrop of Psalm 127, of what God just spoke through the Psalms. And Jesus says this, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, he wants to give you something that you cannot take for yourself. Jesus is the model, the epitome, the perfection of a non-anxious presence. He modeled what it's like for us to live fully trusting God, fully depending on God time and time again. Whether he was sleeping in the middle of the storm or whether he was speaking to the storm itself saying, shh, shh, shh calm down. Whether he was being uh, uh, moved by compassion for the masses and the crowds or whether he was not being moved by the anxiety of the crowds or his even loved disciples who were always trying to push him in ways that he was like, ah, I'm not going to be moved by your anxiety. Yeah, yeah. I only do what I see the Father do. In fact, he would always continually rely on the Father and on the Holy Spirit, choosing not to use his own divinity. He had the power, but he chose to lean on the Father and on the Holy Spirit to model what it's like for us to, when we think we can do it on our, on, our, on our own, we still need to trust in God. And he models this for us. And in the same way, he's asking you to follow him. Follow Jesus the way that he followed the Father. If you could do that, you'll cut anxious carbs. Come to Jesus. He wants to give, say give, he wants to give you something that you cannot achieve through work. And this is really the essence in the beauty of the gospel, isn't it? It's simply that, that God gives us identity and security. That he gives his only son to do and be what we could not do and be. On our best day, we couldn't do that. But he gives it to us. And all we got to do is receive. And this is only the beginning of what he wants to give you. Come to him. Come to him this morning. Whether it's your first time or whether it's your millionth time, he's always saying, come to me. Because when you come to him, he'll give you a name and he'll give you rest. And you can only give what you have. And friends, Jesus has it all. You agree with that? Anybody ready to just, just, just fast from anxious carbs? Not even come just fast. Like, just live differently. And this is the beauty of what we have here. Is when we experience a gospel like this, where it's not based off of our own actions and our own works, you'll actually do more actions and more works out of this feeling of an anxious free life. Where you're now doing more than you've ever done before without feeling the weight of it's all on you. And you have the opportunity not just to experience this 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 aspect of the gospel, but you will be compelled to take this into the community here because there are people who, who Jesus wants them to come to him so that they can receive the rest that you receive. And if we don't get the rest in here, I'm not sure how we're going to help someone get it out there. Yeah. It starts here, but it does not end here. Amen? Amen. Father, help us this morning. God, help us receive what you are giving. Help us to stop striving and working hard for what you are freely offering those who just ask for it. And if you're in this room and you've never made Jesus Lord and King of your life, and you're like, I'm trying to do good things, I'm actually trying to fix myself up so I can present myself to God, and you're just tired, and you're even recognizing that all the things I've been trying to do to get right, all the hard work, has been in vain. If that's you, I want to tell you, you just need to surrender and come to Jesus. And he will take that burden away. He will give you a name. He will give you rest for your very 
that's you and you say, I've never surrendered to Jesus before. And I want to do that for the first time. Or I'm not sure if I've ever done it before. I've been around for a while, but I've never actually done that. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand so that I can pray for you right now. So I don't see any hands, but I want to tell you this. If that is you in this room, and you're like, I feel so heavy and burdened that I can't even raise my hand, please do not leave here today without talking to someone and say, help me, because I cannot help myself. For everyone else, if you're sitting here saying, I've been working really hard lately, and it feels like I'm coming up short every time. I'm running faster, I'm sleeping less, but I feel like it's in vain. If that's you, or if you're in the room and say, man, I need to go to another level of trust in God, because I trust in myself, in my education, in my bank account, and I, I trust in my skills and my giftings, I trust in that way too much. But if you're in here and say, I need to trust God more. I need to shift the focus from self to God in more areas, if not every area of my life. If that's you, raise your hand right now. If you're saying, I am tired of running. I am tired of striving. I am tired of failing and trying again and coming up short. That I'm building my own Tower of Babels only to find out that it's not going to produce the thing that I thought it was going to produce. I'm tired of, of trying to realize my dreams myself and try to fulfill my dreams myself. I'm tired of chasing empty things only to find out that there's nothing there for me coming up short. If that's you, I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Father, I thank you for all those raising their hand right now. That God, even their act of raising their hand is a sign of faith saying, I surrender trust in myself. God, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, will you fill them with your presence, with your approval, with your love, and your peace. Let them experience rest even right now. God, I'm praying for breakthrough even right now, that some of them have been trying to unlock rest in their lives. That God, right now, you, you, are, you are not giving them the key. You're obliterating the lock. You're removing it away. You are pouring out rest right now for them. You are pouring out peace that goes beyond their understanding, even right now. That their problems and their, their situations, they're not changing in this instant, but their perspective of who you are and what you're doing and what they don't have to do is that they just have to trust in you. God, would you give them that? Or rather, would you let them receive what your word says you have already yes. given them. Yes, God. Yes. God, help us receive all yes, the benefits Lord. of who yes, you are. God. Yes, Lord. Let's leave nothing on the table. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so 